Hey, it's Chris Legion Games. I read the rules so you don't have to. And so this is an immediate reaction video to the latest Lords of Ragnarok update within the last 24 hours that released not only a prototype manual for the rules, but as well as a tabletop simulator version link for three to four. Now, again, being aware from that side of things, and, I mean, that's kind of where I would play this game anyway. I don't think area control games like this are great at two. Often, a lot of times, they fail or have shortcomings. And although there's going to be a solo mode, I would not be surprised if that is not well into the Pledge Manager where we see more information on that. So this is what these rules kind of are in a nutshell. I've read them through. I've thought about them a little bit. Let's give you my immediate thoughts and my reactions, but I'll pull up it here so you can just follow along with me very briefly and we can kind of compare notes, if you will. So here's the page, almost a million euros. Go over to the update section. Go to this latest update, number nine, Fenrir Gate Tabletop Simulator Time. Now what I'll tell you straight from the get-go before I get into the rules just briefly, I am really happy that they are being very responsive, not only in the artwork, the miniature modeling uh, from both of Fenrir and Hell, but also the fact that they're giving it to us. I mean, although, I mean, you've always wanted earlier, this is still more responsive than I was expecting. So I'm gonna give them kudos for that before we get into this. But now that being said, let's take a look at the rules. So here we go. Just basic prototype manual, everything you need to know. It's only really about six pages. So there's not a whole lot to read. So if you're interested in it, I really recommend you go over and read it yourself after this. It just gives you a little bit of an overview. I love the artwork. I love the board splaying. And so that's not the issue that never is the issue with Awakened Realms. The one unique mechanic you really need to know about that is going to be taking a front and center mechanism is this action wheel. We'll talk about that more in a second. The other thing that you really need to know are these rune tokens. These are the two big departures and changes in Ragnarok versus Hellas. Now again, the one thing I'll say is they really need to have someone who does this for money, <laughs> essentially, give this a fine tooth comb. Because although it is good, it's not bad by any means. I was able to read through it. I was able to understand most of it. There is still some jargon in there. There is still some things that I'm reading two or three times to kind of try and grasp it, especially about having played. And this is the type of thing that if you want to be um, really successful, you just need it to flow off of there so you can get a good glimpse of it right away. This is not an overly complex game, and that should not be an issue when you're reading rule books like this, because let's be honest, people are like, oh, well, once you play it once or twice, well, that's the thing, though. When you take it out for the first time at home, you're not going to have played it once or twice. So you don't want to fumble around the first playthrough or two if you don't have to. And this is one of those things right now where you can make a big adjustment. So that being said, I think they need to rearrange a little bit the order. They talk about the victory conditions here but it doesn't give you enough knowledge. And I said this with the Stonemaier Rolling Realms game too, give me a run through more in terms of what I need to know and then get into like the victory conditions here. So here up, you have your victory conditions. The first one, take control of all regions in three lands. Well, I don't know how many regions there are in each of the lands, so it doesn't really help me as much. And so it, it, again, how is that gonna work? How is that going to take effect? I'm not quite sure yet. Second one, take control over five built temples. Well, is that all the temples? Is that uh, more temples than, I, wh where does that lie? And so I don't know that yet. I don't know how to build a temple. Killing two monsters, defeating Loki. Okay, well, that's fine. I, I don't know how to fight yet, but that is what it is. And then we have Ragnarok here. And Ragnarok is really the defining characteristic of this game where they say there are various Ragnarok requirements when three gets flipped over then everybody basically has one turn left in the game and then Ragnarok ends and you can still win on one of these other three mentioned previous conditions but if not then they you know figure out a different way of who's going to win and so it looks to me like sort of a self-contained timer because games that are this big the games that are this vast the games that are this open-ended the biggest concern is that all of a sudden this 90 minute to two hour game is all of a sudden you're at four and a half and nobody's winning because i mean all of these i mean 
are just super hard to get control of and do and you know there's too much take that and it's a little bit of munchkinning piling on the leader and going this way on the leader and then that one on the leader and you know that sort of thing and so that's what Ragnarok looks like to me so maybe they're saying okay we realize that this could potentially go on a lot longer so we're taking that into account and we're making this an end game condition that's going to trigger much sooner than necessarily one of those others now the interesting thing I would like to see is well how many of these games end in Ragnarok you know if you've played 100 games uh you know test how many of these games end in Ragnarok? How many do they end in, I mean, not even the individual ones, but how many non-Ragnarok? You know, where is that split? Is it 50-50? Is it 60-40? Is it 90-10? Like, how important is Ragnarok and how likely is it a actually able to happen from that side of things? Um, they go through a little bit of the regions with the symbols on it. Again, just stuff you can read through. Uh, the game setup here, again, nothing that is terribly interesting from that side of things. But they go a little bit into the rune forges. And we'll talk about that in a second because that goes into uh, part of the player's turn. I'll, I'm going to skip over that for just a second and i'll come back to it because what you need to know about now is the heroes and the armies and when we talk about the asymmetry really what the asymmetry is is the heroes themselves so the big question in this is with these stretch goals with this extra expansions that you're seeing here in the you know whatever this is going to be fully that's going to be the question of how many extra heroes are there because again that's where the asymmetry is going to come that's really the only asymmetric difference right now is those heroes their abilities their origin bonuses that sort of stuff they all have their passive skills and that you're going to be having and then the three skills or attributes that they say authority that is how strong your armies are when you bring them onto the field might is how basically strong is your hero how much of an area can your hero take over and also how many combat cards you draw in the beginning of a hunt which is another aspect we'll talk about in a second here and then wisdom is how many combat cards and runes you can carry at any one time and that is also very very important although it might not seem so yet then they talk about how you're drafting them and you go around and you're placing them on the board and okay you can read that now here is the more interesting part this is the actual turn and it's interesting Interesting because I feel like in other games you're saying okay well on my turn I'm gonna do this one action and then you're gonna take your one action and then I'm gonna take my action and then he's gonna take his action and then you're gonna take your action well in this turn you are getting four different potentially five different actions that you are going to be doing on a turn by turn basis which could be good but also seems a little bit long and that's sort of the downside of it is you're doing all of these things on the various turns so you're having to combo them all within one series of chain but that's a lot of downtime for other people, especially if you say the player count is going to be three or maybe even four at best, right? So the first thing is you're praying. You're using your priest at a monument to get a blessing every single time. Or you can get a rune and get an additional rune. Now, why runes are important and why the different runes are important is we'll get to in a second because that's part of phase three of your action. Then your hero moves or your Drakkar moves. Drakkars are in the sea and they're basically only sea only. So you just need to know that. And they allow you to connect adjacencies from one land area to another if it's connected by a sea with a Drakkar in between. Or you can heal. Move or heal, essentially, is the second part. Now, the third part is this is where the main crux of your actions are going to come in. And this is where those runes that I just talked about come in as well. These runes are going to give you several different kinds, depending on the forges here. There's six different forges, so six different rune types that you're going to have available to you. And so using the variety that you have present at your current time... Again, going along with the wisdom up here of how many ones you can hold total, because you might want duplicates depending on how you want to diversify or how or where you end up on the map near these other rune forges. Uh, you can do actions based on how many runes you have. One rune does this. If you're in a certain area, you can do a corresponding rune to take over a monster in that region or form an alliance with that realm in that area. Second thing is two different runes. So I'm going to blow this up a little bit because I know this is probably a little bit hard to see. So the second one is two different runes. So you have to have two different ones, not two of the same. Activate your army, activate a monster, draw two combat cards. Combat cards are going to be very important as well here in a second. Three different runes. Increase one of said attributes up here that we talked about are so important. Or recruit new army to the field or draw three combat cards. And that's sort of where we get into the activation of the army. You're moving your guys around in the map phase of things. And then you can increase the value if it's by one of your settlements. And so each of these guys are going to have values because that goes back again to the uh, over here. So 
Last part here, you have, and this is where we go back up to the beginning, the action wheel here. I'll scroll back up so you can see the action wheel, this little action wheel right here. Um, and it's a horrible picture. Apparently the, the PDF quality was not that great in this one, but there are six different areas in which you are gonna be placing your individual tokens, if you will, on this action wheel. And each of these different action wheel slots is going to have you different actions that you get hence the action wheel portion of things recruitment mobilization preparation building or i believe the next one is sort of uh monsters or actually yeah six duh i uh, just counted six usurpation is that an actual word somebody look that up in the comment section for me but i mean those are the basic things you're going to be doing and now the interesting thing on this is you can't place one down on the same area on your next turn you have to place it on a different area each turn but you can stack it on somebody else's but if you stack it on somebody else's whoever's is below you even if there's multiple they're all going to get a rune of their choosing so you're giving them essentially an ability to do different actions or more actions on their turn via the runes you're giving them depending on if you really need that action that badly that turn so how do you feel about that? It's sort of a, a follow me sort of a mechanism all within this. I, I don't think it has to be a wheel. I mean, it's kind of superfluous in the sense that it's a wheel. It could have been any shape. It could have been anything like that, except the fact that it sits in the middle of the board. And that's one of the Ragnarok conditions is who controls the most lands around the uh, action wheel space in the first place which is kind of a weird honestly from that side of things but it just gives you through you know examples of what you're going to be doing very similar to the other actions that we've already talked about and the only difference is being right here building a temple you're taking one part of a temple here placing it in a region with a shrine without a temple and getting your priest so i mean you're getting this blessing draft where you're going to draft blessing cards which is fine and the monsters okay you can activate monsters hunt monsters or hunt loki so that's going to be real popular too and now the interesting thing is not that one it's this last one right here it is choosing a monument and building the next level of it because what that does essentially and this is uh why it's important here is this third part right here is it removes all priests that you're laying out at the beginning of the turns because otherwise your priests stay there you don't like take them back at the beginning of the round then remove all control tokens from that action wheel that you just placed there so everybody's not just yours anytime somebody does this action of build a monument it removes everything and that's important because like my, originally when i was looking at this well how are you going to hunt monsters if i can never place one here again well if you want to hunt and place one here again somebody's going to have to clear it here first and then you can be able to put it here again so that's the question is how are you going to go back and forth who's going to trigger what how are you going to feel about that when it's triggered uh you know you recharge all your artifacts and you get all your priests back so event cards happen and event cards are you know monsters and so if they haven't spawned yet discard it and spawn the monster otherwise activate all listed on the card you can control monsters we talked about that if you hunt your own monster it's going to be uh out of your grasp then they talk a little bit about the hunt and now this is the other this is the part that worries me. This is the part that worries me the most. And I'll talk about it here on this page because the illustration is pretty good. Uh, there are the ability to not kill steal, uh, like there was, I think, in the last game, but you can get partial kills. So like on this one, if there are eight spots, if somebody has at least four, uh, no matter who does the final blow, if you do the final blow, you get credit for slaying it. Uh, if you have at least four of these rune spots filled, you are going to also get credit for slaying it when it is actually slain which is another very interesting mechanic, I guess maybe to balance out people who are only just going for monster slaying to make them diversify and maybe not focus on them as much so that you can sort of hit and run away because the wounds stay in place between rounds. The monsters don't heal. And then when they die, you get the rune corresponding to whatever is underneath it from that side of things. Why am I concerned about the hunt? At least superficially, it seems like it could be a little bit convoluted. You have these cards. Monster player draws cards. Then they play as many combat cards as shown on their card. And then they choose one because the player is actually playing as the monster if they're sitting next to him or if that another player controls them, you know, whatever. Uh, you get to choose to attack or defend or not. But if you want to defend, you have to play your own cards. Discard combat cards are equal to the number of, uh, you know, value of the cards played by the monster. So if the monster plays a value of four, you have to discard cards that have the total value of four between them. And if you do, then you're successful and not getting the monster effect or the monster damage. Um, but then if you played a number greater than the weak spot value, then you get to draw two cards instead of one at the end of the attack. Again, because you only have so many cards limited in each round. 
And so then you get to decide whether or not you continue. Because if you can't deal more wounds, if you don't have enough cards, you can't get more. And so that's why some of those actions we talked about in a minute ago in terms of the runes make a big difference in terms of drawing two, drawing three, that side of things. And so you have to be able to do enough wounds to end the hunt, essentially. And here's all the hunt rewards are assigned to your wound slots. Then you are automatically dealt one injury as well. Uh, battle between two players. I mean, it's just back and forth, this card combo. Now, the card combo uh, combat is a little bit more straightforward where you're choosing to play combo cards, but you also have to worry about attrition because there's going to be cards with casualties, and then you're going to have to lose that amount of value of your armies, uh, depending on if you played, I mean, assuming stronger cards, you're going to have more casualties. So you just need to be aware of it from that side of things. But the monster side of things just seems very much a lot of card play a lot more like the witcher than i was expecting in terms of back and forth monster playing cards hero playing cards monster playing cards hero playing cards kind of blocking with some of the hero cards or do you risk it just take the injury so that you can deal damage in the first place or do you uh you know block it so that you can try and draw new cards because your other ones weren't going to be that successful um that's that's kind of it there's not really anything else it's a very interesting nutshell. I can see why people are interested by it. I can see why people like it now. Um, let's go and I'll give you my final thoughts. So, I don't know. What do you think? I, I'm a little bit underwhelmed, but I'm also a little bit pleased because I was not expecting it to be the short either. It seems relatively succinct, and it's honestly, it's not a bad copy of the rules. You can read through most of it, except for the hunt stuff, which kind of gets a little blurry there at times, but you read it through two or three times and you can kind of get a pretty good glimpse of what it's actually entailing. So now that you've read this, now that you've looked at this, does this entice you more? Does this entice you less? Is it going to affect your pledge at all? I don't know. Because, you know, with the expansion right now, at least the only one that we know of in terms of the stretch goal box contents, because they haven't announced any others, which yeah, who knows what they're going to do on that side of things. Is that going to help you? Is that going to hurt you? You're going to see more monsters. You're going to see more heroes uh, with the stretch goals. And so, especially when you only have, what, three heroes or no, three monuments and five heroes, I think, in the core, plus whatever monsters there are, I forget that number, uh, more is probably going to be better. But, you know, also when you have more, you have worry about balance, too. So it's going to be interesting. I guess some of the stretch goal ones add some more complexity there, too. So that's why this is only for the core right now. So, yeah, let me know what you think. I don't know. I, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure now. <laughs> As if I was sure before. I wasn't sure before either. This doesn't make it any easier for me, but I'm going to be watching until the end, and it's probably going to be a last-minute decision on my pledge. So there you go. Latest update from Lords of Ragnarok. Hopefully it's helpful. Let me know. Thanks. Stay classy. See you around.